Happy New Year and welcome and good evening. I'm Tom Dowling, from the President of the Greater Keene Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of the Chamber, I want to welcome you to our annual gala, It Must Be in the Water. Each year we get together to celebrate the year just ended, to celebrate and discuss what the future might hold, to discuss and honor the business of the year and the citizen of the year, and to thank the people who helped. Our evening's theme, It Must Be in the Water, suggests that we don't have a concrete answer for questions like, what makes Keen so special? How does everything get so well coordinated? And what is it that causes us to be what we are? Is it because we have people who care? Other communities have people who care. Is it because we form great coalitions? Coalitions exist in other places. Possibly, it's the volunteering we do. I know. It's the bright people we have in the area. Well, there are some bright people in other places. It could be the somewhat isolated nature of the area that results in resilience and independence. Is it luck, great leadership, vision, commitment, resources? See, there's no really logical or easy answer. Therefore, it must be in the water. I want to welcome you all to our annual gala and to celebrate who we are and what we are. To start off our evening, I'd like to acknowledge some of our special guests. Representing U.S. Representative Paul Hodes, Lead Marthy. Marthy, if you'd stand up, please, Lee. Someone who's involved in a myriad of projects to help the greater Keene area, Senator Molly Kelly. Our local community leader and a friend of our business community and the chamber, Mayor Dale Pregent. <laughs> and a leader who's been a driving force in a collaboration to help revitalize manufacturing in the lab at Adams Technology Center, our host and president of Keene State Collins, Dr. Helen Giles G. As you might notice, I've cut down my speech this evening. So it's my pleasure, <laughs> it's now my pleasure to introduce the co-chairs of our annual gala, Sue Blothenberg of PSNH and Marianne Christensen of Hannah Grimes. And we'll keep it short too. I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's event, and we hope you're having a good time this evening. Uh, as we were organizing the event this year, I have to say that um, the entire committee was incredibly heartened by the response of the business community to helping to sponsor this event tonight. Uh, I think we've gotten about twice as much in sponsorship um, this year than we have in other years which is just amazing in this economy, and um, we're just very grateful to all of our sponsors. So, <laughs> we are certainly living in interesting economic times, and um, you know, just with the response that we've gotten from the business community, we're really grateful. We'd like to especially acknowledge our platinum sponsors for this uh, event and they are CNS Wholesale Grocers and the Mananoc Economic Development Corporation. And we'd ask a representative from each of them to please come forward and accept a plaque and our gratitude.
on behalf of Mary Ann and myself, the entire annual dinner, excuse me, annual Gaylor committee, would like to thank you all for coming this evening. I hope you have a good time. We have a fabulous meal ready for you, and I'm the happy announcer that dinner is to be served. So please enjoy your dinner, and then shortly after dinner, the program will continue. Thank you for coming. My name is Brian Donovan. I'm chair of the Greater Keene Chamber of Commerce. And it's my privilege to introduce to you tonight's speaker, Lou Feldstein. Lou has been with the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation since 1986. Under his leadership, the foundation has become the largest funder of nonprofit organizations in northern New England, with assets growing from $25 million to $375 million at the end of 2008. Before coming to the foundation, Lou was provost of Antioch University, New England. He served for seven years as senior staff to New York City Mayor John Lindsay. He has worked as a journalist and with the civil rights movement in Mississippi. In 2008, Lou was selected as Nonprofit Times Power and Influence Top 50 Nonprofit Executives. Business New Hampshire Magazine has twice named him as one of the 10 most influential people in New Hampshire. And the New Hampshire Century Concord Monitor profiles Lou as one of the 100 people who shaped New Hampshire. He was recently honored with the New Hampshire Lifetime of Service Award and has received seven honorary doctorates. Lou has written and lectured widely on social capital, community building, and charitable giving, and has served on numerous national boards of directors. With Robert Putnam of Harvard University, he co-founded the Suaro Seminar and he also co-founded the Civic Engagement in America and co-authored Better Together, Restoring the American Community. More importantly, and this is very, very important, Lou was the wine steward on John Wayne's yacht in the Mediterranean for a year. And also, was Master of Ceremonies of the International Zucchini Festival for six years. <laughs> Lou holds a bachelor degree from Brown University and a Master of Arts in Law and Diplomacy from the Fletcher School at Tufts University. He lives in Hancock, New Hampshire. Let's give a warm welcome for Lou. Thank you, Brian. Wow. Well, it feels to me much like coming home. And what I have to say tonight, I hope, is going to say something about what this region and this part of the state has meant to me in my life, while also speaking to the question of, that's before everyone, which is, what's in the water? Before I do that, though, I think I, I might say a word about the John Wayne experience, just so you have some basis to judge the veracity and wisdom of what the rest of my message. Um, it's not that funny. And I'll tell you how I got this job. I was working in Spain after finishing college, building roads on a road crew, and I hitched over to the seacoast, uh, over to, to Lisbon, and tried to talk my way onto a Portuguese fishing boat. And I spent several days and made no headway at all. And then someone on one of these fishing boats said, hey, if you really want a job on a boat, uh, there's a big American yacht looking to hire someone. Uh, and it belongs to John Wayne. It's down there. So I said, oh, I'm going to get that job. So I walked quickly over to this other boat. And I found the captain and asked about the job and told the captain I'd had a lot of experience on the water, which wasn't quite true, uh, but I figured they weren't hiring me to be the captain of this boat. This is a 146-foot former minesweeper. Uh, so I get the job, 
and I'm on the boat two days, and I still hadn't met Duke. He was there, but paid no attention to me. I was a nobody. And uh, after two days, the captain and uh, John Wayne's brother came along, and they asked where somebody was, and I said, oh, I think he's downstairs in the basement. <laughs> right, so. <laughs> and so the captain looked at me and said, huh, I'll come back and see you. So he came back and he said, now, tell me about this boating experience you've had. <laughs> and the truth was, at that point in my life, I literally had never been on anything on the water except for a canoe and the Staten Island Ferry. <laughs> so the captain said, well, I think you're done here. Um, not because you don't have much boating experience, but because I don't want someone on the crew who lies to me. But I'm going to think about it overnight. You can sleep aboard, and I'll see you in the morning. So I go to bed, figuring I've blown this incredible gig. And uh, I come up in the morning at 6.30 when the crew had breakfast, and the captain was there, and I said, so? And he said, you are lucky. You're really lucky. I said, what do you mean? He said, well... I was talking to Duke about you and firing you, and Duke said, tell me about this kid. So I told John Wayne something about you and your two Ivy League degrees and so forth, and Duke said, don't fire this kid. I want you to change his job. I want him to work directly for me, because this kid sounds like he represents everything that's worst about America. Uh, He's one of these Eastern liberal intellectuals with two Ivy League degrees who doesn't know squat about anything. <laughs> but the word wasn't squat, but that was the Duke. And so for the next uh, year, I worked with the Duke and demonstrated that he was right about most things about that. <laughs> and then I came here. So uh, with that as preface, uh, and without a lot of time, I want to use my few moments with you to address this question of what's in the water. No, by the way, there was no reference intended linking the boating and, and the water and so forth. <laughs> but this question is an interesting one, and I've always wondered what makes keen keen, what's special about it. Uh, and at first, I thought you might need a chemist or a hydrologist to answer this. I'm a philanthropist. But I do have some thoughts. Uh, and I want to link my ideas of what makes Keene special with my own experience. So I'm going to go back once again to my own life. And I'm going to start with when I came up here. I landed here in Keene, well, in the Monadnock region, 36 years ago. And that decision to come here has made all the difference in my life. On a Friday evening in January of 1974, I signed off in New York City the last time as the anchor of an evening news program in New York, a TV news program called 51st State. And with my family, we drove that night, that Friday, up to Hancock, where we have lived for the past 36 years. So I went immediately from appearing live nightly on New York City TV before hundreds of thousands of people to arriving in Hancock, which then had less than a thousand people. And that was a bit of a shock for this city boy. And I came determined that I was going to fit in. I was going to be part of the scene up here. So that very first year, I decided to sugar, and I took a whole bunch of buckets that were in the garage or in the barn where we lived, and I hung the buckets out, except I made a slight mistake. I tapped the oak trees. <laughs> so you can imagine the reaction in the Hancock Cash Market when I came in, because it was pretty bad. So I used to be on the case of these people in the cash market about why don't you carry the New York Times daily? And of course, Mike Cass, who then worked in the cash market, kept trying to sell me the, uh, the union leader, buy a real paper. Jim, the uh, Sentinel was not even an issue back then for the, in Hancock. Uh, but there's a point in my telling this opening story about my arrival in New Hampshire. I came here as a rank outsider. In many ways, I was at odds with a lot of what seemed the norms of the area. 
I was a Democrat from a big city. I was very liberal, Jewish, and in many ways quite different from the community I felt like I walked into. But the point is, New Hampshire accepted me for who I was and enabled me to be part of this community first and then larger communities. And never, never in the 36 years have I been here in New Hampshire, notwithstanding the joking and notwithstanding the heat I take occasionally for supporting the Yankees, but I, ne I never once felt uncomfortable or unwelcome or a stranger or an outsider. And significantly, when we're talking about what's in the water, I don't think my experience in coming here is different than many of the rest of you. Let me ask, just as a question, how many of you here were born outside New Hampshire? Born outside New Hampshire. Look around, okay. How many were born in New Hampshire? That's pretty startling. You know, the percentage in Amer of Americans born outside the state they live in is 38%. The percentage of people in New Hampshire who were not born here is 58%. There are only eight other states in America that have a smaller percentage of native born. We don't remember that always. In fact, the genius of New Hampshire, or the, that, the malevolence of New Hampshire, is to make those of us who are two-thirds of the majority here feel like we're from away and that they dominate. <laughs> but the bad news, for those of you who believe that there's something in the native blood, is that it's not the bloodline that makes New Hampshire special. It's not, there may be something in the water, but it's not in the gene pool, because almost 60% of us come from away here. So these are not qualities that make Keene special or New Hampshire special that we inherit from other, from other New Hampshire people or, or inherit in our bloodline. So I want to move upstream a little bit and talk about, put all this in a larger context. And I want to talk briefly about something called social capital, which some of you have heard about, but I want to link it to Menadnock. Two caveats as I say this. First of all, I'm going to make a lot of assertions and I'm not going to give you any data behind these. So you're going to have to trust me because I don't want to waste any time. But after this, I'll answer that. And second, when I say some of this, to some of you, you'll go, ah, ha, 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 I get that. And some of you will say, aha, that's helpful. And then some of you will say, I don't, where'd you get that from? And I'm not going to have time to answer the questions, but I'll be around later if people want to talk. So, Simple definition of social capital, and you see why this links to the question that the chamber asks, what's in the water? Simple definition is that the people you know matters. Our connections of neighbors, friends, family, people we do business with makes a big difference. It makes so much difference that there are economists who can literally assign a dollar value to your Rolodex. Now, I told this story at the Stanford Business School about a year ago, and there was this blank look, and I realized they had no idea what a Rolodex was. <laughs> you know, the face page and LinkedIn and everything, there are no Rolodexes. But this is true, this power of connection, not only for those of us with a decent education and decent income, it is also true for some of the poorest people in this country. When this country went through the first five years of welfare reform in the late 1990s and early 2000, and they said, who got jobs? You know what the best test was of who got jobs? Not the quality of, of their education or their daycare or the health program or transportation. All those mattered. But the best predictor of who got jobs were people who knew somebody. But it wasn't what they call a strong connection. It was a weak connection. People they didn't know well, where they'd done some catering, some yard work, some babysitting, some maintenance, some house cleaning. That got people their jobs. That's connections. That's social capital. I'll give you one more example to help you illustrate this. If you are not a member of a single organization and in one year you join one organization, your chances of dying that year drop 50%. If you join a second organization, your chances of dying drop another 
Now, it doesn't go on. It's not unlimited. You know? uh, the line is, the line is, this is not a membership pitch. The line is, is asymptotic. It goes up and then comes over like that. And there are probably plenty of people in this room who are too committed and at risk the other way. But the point is, the point is something we all know, that being absolutely alone literally can kill you. And there's a huge amount of public health data that says that it is a close call as to what will kill you first or what is more risky for your health, being absolutely alone, smoking three packs of cigarettes a day, or being grossly obese. Connections matter. We all know that. We know it from our parents and our grandparents. But I don't want to spend any more time talking about the individual benefits. I want to talk about what does it mean to be in a community where people are well connected. What's not the private benefits, the individual benefits that, that come to me for my education and, and uh, my income or for my health, I want to say what's the spillover, the public benefits, the bystander effects of a lot of connections? Because that's what brings 370 of us here tonight. That's why you come together. And I want you to understand the power of this. And I'm going to do this by telling you three quick anecdotes to try and make this alive. First of all, I mean, a simple example. How many of you have actually now or sometime in your life worked at a place where you brought your lunch to work and put it in a shared refrigerator? OK. And but can you tell me, when you did it, was it safe? OK, Bill, Bill says it was safe. Now, what does that mean? It means that he put his lunch in a shared refrigerator, and every time Harry or Susie or someone else walked by towards the kitchen, he didn't have to look up like that. Ah, is my sandwich safe? It was safe. He didn't have to bring his own refrigerator to work. He didn't have to put a lock on the refrigerator. I'm not making a big point, but there was a norm of trust in that organization that saved everybody some money and made the organization work better and allowed him to focus on his work. That's that norm of trust, which we have here, a terrific degree, is part of this social capital. Let me take it one level up. You come into Keene, you come to a four-way stop sign, you stop. You stop because you don't want to get busted. You stop because you don't want to have an accident. You also stop because you know everyone else is going to stop. You know, when you stop, you come to the stop sign, and then you do this little dance, you look around like that, figure when you make you move, and then you say, okay, now and you go across, and you get across. And if you're a wonk like me, and you read the traffic studies, you will know you can move more people through that intersection if people regulate themselves than if you have a police officer there or a traffic light. People do a better job. But what's happening here? What's happening here is everyone trusts that their turn will come, that everyone else will stop and you'll get your turn. In the first story I told about Bill and his lunch, he knew everybody in the work site. But this is strangers. You don't know everyone at that stop sign. So social capital, trust, works among strangers as well, and it makes our lives better. It makes it simpler, faster, cleaner. Third example, going one level up higher, trickier one in New Hampshire paying taxes. In this country, 135 million Americans pay their taxes every year. Again, we pay because we don't want to get busted, we don't want to get audited, you know, we don't break the law and so forth. But the chance of being audited for most of us are very slight. 3,100 auditors in the IRS, 135 million taxpayers, you do the numbers. Your chance of being audited are not high. So, People are paying their taxes, though, because basically, even if you don't like everything the government does, you don't like some of the programs, you may not like the president in a given year, but still, you know that at some crude level, you get some benefit from that, A, and B, you know that almost everyone else is also paying their taxes. You're not a sucker. I don't know everyone in this room, but I'll bet virtually everyone in this room pays their taxes. And there's a bit of trust involved in that, too, except it's no longer among a handful of people in a work site or in a people driving to a stop sign in Keene. It's 135 million people. And if you don't think that makes a difference, those of you who've lived overseas in countries where only one out of three or one out of four pay their taxes, think if you'd pay your taxes if that was a situation. 
You paid here because you trust the system at some crude level to work for you. So I could go on with these kinds of stories, but the basic point is we all benefit from this. And the bottom line on this, the bottom line is if you care, compared any two communities to see and so that you knew which one had the stronger social capital, the greater connections and ties to one another, you would find that in the one with the higher social capital, where the trust and the connections are higher, here's what you'd find. First, that people genuinely feel better about their lives. They feel they can make a difference, a sense of efficacy. Second, they literally are healthier on a dozen important measures. Third, they are safer, less crimes against their home, their family, themselves. Fourth, their schools work better. Dollar for dollar, they get more out of their schools. Fifth, they trust local government more, and it's more efficient, less corruption, faster service, politer people, and finally, huge benefits for the business community. Social capital matters hugely. We have it here in a terrific degree. So I want to end now by giving you some cautions. It's not enough for the chamber to say it's in the water because it's in the water implies it's there, nothing we can do about it. The answer is we can lose it. There is nothing that guarantees that we hold on to the high social capital we have in Keene. I didn't take time to explain that, but by lots of surveying we've been part of, Keene ranks very high in social capital across the country. Uh, surveys that we've published, so we know that. But it's not fixed that we will keep it. We could lose it. And I'm going to give you four danger signs and then finish. Here are the four things that put social capital at risk in Keene, despite all the many things. First of all, there is a growing gap between the rich and the poor. You know it's true in this country. 1990, there were only three states in the country that had a lower had a, where the gap between rich and poor was bigger than New Hampshire. Ten years later, there were 17 states that looked better than New Hampshire. This year, when the census comes out, we're going to turn out to be even worse. The income gap is growing. That breaks a community apart. Second, we as America have to learn to live increasingly with a society that's multi-ethnic, multi-racial, Keene is slower than the rest of the country to have to deal with that, but we too will have a changing population. And we know that as the population changes and becomes less homogeneous, it strains the, the, the public. And we have to deal with that. Now, this country's dealt with it in the early 1900s incredibly well, but we will have to deal with it again. Third, next to last point, we are spending more time driving. Simple fact. Every additional 10 minutes you spend driving in your car reduces by 10% your connections and your trust and all the things that make social capital. You're less likely to vote, to give to charity, to volunteer. And finally, one last one which is a little odder and a little hard to know for sure which way it'll cut, and that is the growing use of the internet. This is one of the most heavily wired states in the country. And this area is, with, despite the pockets, is fairly well wired. We don't know whether that cuts down or increases the connections and ties among people. The point of all this is to say that this is a charge, I'm trying to say it as a charge to the chamber. No one, no one is better positioned because of the mix of people that are in this room to make a difference on this. Don't take it for granted. There's no way that this extraordinary community which we have automatically sustains itself. We could lose it. And don't just, we can't just be passive and say, uh, it just come either way, kumbaya, it doesn't matter. It matters, but you have to do something about it. So as someone who has been hugely blessed by what this community is and how it works, and with a huge stake in what it means, and because so much of the rest of the country can learn from us, I say that the final message is, please don't screw it up. Save it for us. Thanks. Thank you very much for that inspiring message. Senator Kelly, Mayor Pregent, President Giles G. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the theme, as you know, this evening is what's in the water. Last year, the country, and indeed the world, witnessed a catastrophic financial meltdown that led to the most severe recession since the 1930s. Gross domestic product dropped by almost 12 percent. The budget deficit has ballooned. The number of bankruptcies has soared. Banks have failed. Venerable Wall Street institutions have vanished. While many large financial companies needed government help to stay in business, even manufacturing companies like General Motors and Chrysler needed emergency relief to keep them from shutting down. Unemployment reached double digits for the first time in over 20 years. What's in the water? Here in New Hampshire, the unemployment rate in October reached 6.8% which makes our state tied for the ninth out of 50 for the lowest unemployment rate. Yet in the Monadnock region, the unemployment rate is lower at 5.9%. According to Forbes magazine, the Greater Keene area is the third most resistant to economic downturn out of the 500 micropolitan areas in the entire United States. What's in the water? Many nonprofit organizations are suffering under the strain of the recession. Indeed, many chambers of commerce throughout the country have felt the pinch. However, I am proud to inform you that your Chamber of Commerce ended its fiscal year this September with a small profit. What's in the water? My friends, the question is not what, but who. Looking at the list of the names of the past winners of the Windsor Brooks Business of the Year Award and the Community Service Citizen of the Year Award answers this question of who is making a difference. Look at our sponsors tonight, our platinum sponsors, CNS Wholesalers and Monadnock Economic Development Corporation. Our gold sponsors, Cheshire Medical Center, Citizens Bank, Connecticut River Bank, Marriott Courtyard, Ocean Bank, Peerless Insurance, and Public Service of New Hampshire. Our silver sponsors are Massiello Employment Services, Savings Bank of Walpole, and Smith's Medical. These organizations are made up of dedica dedicated people and community-minded leaders. It is the people, the most precious resource we have that makes this area so attractive so productive and so outstanding. It is the talent of the people we have at the chamber, Tom Dowling, Sue Newcomber, Cindy Boynton, Brenda Woods, Natalie Reed, and Susan Whitley that make this chamber the envy of many other chambers. Many of you know how bright, talented, and committed they are. The people who serve on our board of directors are also passionate about the Chamber's mission, which is to advance the commercial, industrial, educational, cultural, recreational, and general welfare of the greater Keene area. My predecessor, Bill O'Meara, is a testimony to this fact. His dedication to the Chamber and his work in the community is well known. Look around you at your tables. The people here tonight show the immense talent and commitment of the members of the chamber to this lovely and precious community of ours. It is the who of the area, the people who make this community alive. This past year, the chamber has introduced a new logo and new recruitment tools. This year, we will revamp the website to make it even better focus on increasing the volunteer efforts of our community, and develop a plan to make Keene the best business community by the year 2020. The Chamber will do this cost effectively with help from a dedicated group of volunteers. At the Chamber, we hope to get more people involved. People like you, bright, talented, and committed to help make our business community stronger and better able to help you grow. The Chamber needs volunteers on its committees. 
Many of you do not have the time to serve on the board, but service on a committee is a possibility. The committees do the vital work of the chamber. It is also a great place to train our future board members. If we could have 30 volunteers, 30 more volunteers, committed to the greater Keene area business community, the work that we could get done would truly be phenomenal. I would ask each of you, business owners and managers of companies, to consider either serving on a committee yourself or allowing one of your employees to serve. It's a great way to have exposure for your business and a great way for your employees to grow personally. Please call Tom or speak to me or any other board member about that possibility. Thank you also very much for your support of our organization and the business community in general. You are the main ingredient in the water that makes us the special community we are. Thank you very much. Now it's an honor for me to ask our past chair, Bill O'Meara, to come up to the podium. Please, Bill. <laughs> As many of you know, Bill is a tireless champion for Keene. In addition to the chamber, Bill has been active in many local organizations, including a lead role in the Keene Property Owners Association and Monadnock Economic Development Corporation. Bill has seen the chamber through some challenging times. And as an example of his devotion, he's here tonight on his wedding anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> so Bill, on behalf of the chamber, I would like to give you this token of our deep appreciation. Let's give Bill a great round of applause. Thank you very much, and that's the treat for tonight, is I'm only going to say a thank you. Uh, Lou and Brian um, expressed all the feelings that I have. Uh, the thank you is to be um, able to hang around with folks like you, the doers in the community, and, uh, and people that make things happen. Lou is absolutely right. It's nothing to be taken for granted. It has to be worked at every day, and everyone here as a piece of that overall success. Um, it's amazing how you go from one meeting to another meeting and see all the same faces, and it's why this community is what it is. So, and I think I've, I tried to sell the, the celebration tonight to my wife as an anniversary thing that I put together, but <laughs> I guess that's, that's blown for now. But uh, um, without, without helps of your, your spouses and, and friends, uh, none of this gets done either. So thank you to, to her and thank you to all of you. Thank you, Bill. It's now my privilege to introduce Karen House. Karen is here representing Keene State College, the 2004 winner of the Windsor Brooks Business of the Year Award. Karen will announce this year's winner. Karen? Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Good evening, everyone. This is really a, a wonderful honor, and I appreciate very much being with you all and having the opportunity to uh, present the 2009 Windsor Brooks uh, Greater Keene Chamber of Commerce Business of the Year Award. Um, as you may know, the Windsor Brooks Award recognizes a business's uh, outstanding contribution to the economic strength, community health, and social well-being of the Greater Keene area. And Mr. Brooks, who was a, a long-time uh, retail owner uh, on Main Street in downtown Keene, was actually instrumental in forming the Greater Keene Chamber of Commerce. 
Before, though, I turn to that task and present that award, I, I want to take a moment um, to acknowledge the members of the selection committee uh, because each of them actually represented uh, a member, uh, I'm sorry, an organization that has been acknowledged as the Windsor Brooks Business of the Year for each of the last five years. So in, uh, in the order of the most recent to, to um, beyond. Um, in 2008, the winner was Clark Mortensen, and Clark Mortensen was represented on the committee by Heather Minkler, who actually chaired the committee this year. Um, 2007, Monadnock Radio Group, Bob Cox. 2006, Fenton Family Dealerships, Bill Fenton was on the committee. 2005, Ted Schuensport, Ted McGreer. And 2004 was Keene State College. So again, my special privilege to stand before you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations to all of those organizations, those fine organizations. And now I get to turn to the task. Giving back to the community and, and promoting the health and enrichment of the communities where this organization and their employees are located is reflected throughout the corporate culture of our winner this year. They have even developed a corporate social responsibility strategic plan to specifically define their commitment to the communities. Helping to strengthen, I'm sorry, helping to eliminate hunger, strengthen communities, protect the environment, and encourage volunteerism. This business and its employees make a difference. They give back in quite a number of ways. A few examples are they distribute mini-grants in the form of food and cash for local projects, such as the Keene City Bike Rack Project, Keene High School Project Graduation, Relay for Life, and MCVP's Walk a Mile in Her Shoes event. <clears throat> They sponsor local events like the Pumpkin Festival, the Keene Music Festival, and the Thanksgiving Farm Fair at Stonewall Farm. In addition, their environmental initiatives help to offset the greenhouse gas footprint of their facilities and the round trip commutes by their employees, along with a very active recycling program. In addition, and especially in this year, I think this is really notable, our business of the year has raised over $200,000 in employee pledges and corporate matches for the annual United Way campaign, and they were designated as one of only 125 national corporate leaders by the United Way of America. They have donated over 40 tons of food to the Community Kitchen and New Hampshire Food Bank, and they have partnered with Cheshire Medical Center on several wellness initiatives in support of Vision 2020 for the benefit of their employees. If this is not enough, they support their employees by encouraging them to give back through community volunteerism, like so many of you do as well, and they have heartily answered the call by serving on local boards and committees and rolling up their sleeves and participating in numerous volunteer events. Our 2009 Windsor Brooks Business of the Year is a large company with small town roots and a very big heart. They're proud to call Keene their home, and we are proud to honor them as our business of the year. I would like all of you to please join me in congratulating the 2009 Windsor Brooks Business of the Year for the Greater Keene Chamber of Commerce, CNS Wholesale. Congratulations. Thank you very much. On behalf of Rick Cohen and the thousand employees that work here in Keene, we're very pleased to receive this award. We're also very humbled. When you get the recognition of quality employers and your peers within the community, it is a humbling event. We do have, as, as it was shared, a dual role that we believe that, that we can contribute to the community. We believe that we can grow our business and do well financially and continue to provide job opportunities. We've been fortunate to be able to do that. But we also believe that we need to do good in the communities. 
And we have people that work really hard at CNS. In case any of you are interested in joining us, we do have opportunities at CNS. But we work really hard. But we have employees that we consider to be heroes in the communities. They get done at work and they go out on their weekends in their own time and devote themselves to making the community a better place for us as an employer and for their family and friends. Those are the types of employees that are attracted to CNS, that we want to join the company and join our communities. And I'm glad to receive this award. I'm glad to be able to share with you what we do at the company, as well as the heroes that work for us, not only in Keene, but the 18,000 employees that work for us across the United States. It's a real credit to Rick Cohen in building this business. Three years ago, when I was recruited to join the company, he didn't have the great line about what's in the water. What he shared with me is that this is a magical community. He has a commitment to this company. He has a commitment to this community. Our employees have a commitment to both. Thank you very much. We're pleased to receive it. And um, we do actually have a plaque that we will be presenting later. I have to apologize for that um, omission. Um, but actually, the best news is that he gets to join the committee next year. And so you will see. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Congratulations, CNS. And my final duty for this evening is to have the pleasure to introduce to you the winner of the 2008 last year's award for the Community Service uh, Citizen of the Year because he will uh, have the opportunity to announce this year's winner. And so let me please call up Cameron Tees to the lecture. Good evening. Well, I remember uh, thinking shortly after uh, Mary presented the Citizen of the Year Award to me last year that I'd be doing this tonight and uh, hoping that I would do it as well as uh, the honor that was given to me. Officers, officers and members of the Greater Keene Chamber of Commerce, honored guests, friends of the Chamber, and friends of Greater Keene. One year ago, I stood here completely surprised and humbled by the honor of receiving the Greater Keene Chamber of Commerce Citizen of the Year Award for 2008. I remember trying to express my appreciation for the award and to all the people and organizations in the room who I am con connected with and who made it possible for me to be so honored. I continue to be moved and inspired by that thought, and I look out as I look out into the audience tonight and I want to thank you and all the, everyone else here who helped to create the very special fabric of our community that made it possible. Last year, Mary Delisle, the previous year's awardee, spoke of growing up in Keene and how the strong spirit of community and neighborhood helped influence and shape her life. I'm a transplant too, similar to what uh, Lou said earlier, having moved here in the early 80s. However, it didn't take long for me to recognize the richness of this community in the region. People helped each other, cared about and for one another, and rolled up their sleeves and pitched in with money, hard work, or both. My upbringing did stress service and the importance of it, and once here in this area, I was given the opportunity to serve in many different capacities. My employers were supportive of my volunteer work, the community had a process to identify the needs, and very soon, I felt like I was part of the community. Each of us has defining moments. Mine was in 1989 when my son, Sean, was involved in a serious car accident. His courage, his spirit, they gave me examples. He gave me examples of giving back to others, even under those very difficult circumstances. I'm still inspired by it. 
This experience not only taught me about the special fabric of our community, but it increased my determination for making a difference as part of it. Tonight we're here to honor another citizen, a person who richly deserves the recognition of being Citizen of the Year, although it would probably be the last, last thing on that person's mind. This year's recipient has the distinction of being the 50th person so honored since the award was first given to Guy McMillan in 1960. The purpose of the Greater Keene Chamber of Commerce Citizen of the Year Award is to recognize an individual for outstanding and unselfish giving of his or her time and talent to produce a lasting benefit to the community. In recognizing one individual each year, it is hoped that the award will inspire others to give more of themselves to community life. The new Citizen of the Year is selected by the previous five recipients, who are Mary Delisle, Drew Landry, Audrey Hadcock, Jim Putnam, and myself. The person's identity is kept a secret from all until this annual gala event. This year's presentation will have a different twist, a first actually. We all remember firsts, such as our first child or the first time the Patriots won the Super Bowl. Tonight's first is that the person receiving this award is not here in this room. The reason that they are not here is very much part of their fabric and a characteristic that is consistent with the commitment and service for which they are being honored. Fortunately, we have technology that will give you a snapshot a little later of this person who is still unaware of being this year's recipient. Most of us are familiar with ev evaluations through school, work, and other aspects of our lives. Often we're asked to look at things from a couple of angles, narrative and numeric, or qualitative and quantitative. Tonight I'll walk you through some of the qualitative and then the quantitative attributes possessed by this year's recipient that makes this person so deserving of the, wor the award. And if you'll bear with me, I am going to say some things that are grammatically incorrect as I identify this individual as a plural, as their, in an effort to avoid his or her, which would give it away. Here's some, but not all, of the qualitative attributes. The recipient is a pillar of our community, having carried on family heritage of community service and inspired their children and grandchildren to do the same. They have given exemplary service to the community as a business person, member of nonprofit boards, and volunteer. The recipient has courage of convictions and stands up for what they believe in while respecting other opinions. They are open-minded and willing and able to change. I have, heard, I have heard it said of this person that they stand vigil. The recipient is a champion of people in need by helping people overcome adversity. Some of have said of him, of them, <laughs> okay. <laughs> some have said of them that they would give their right arm if someone needed it more. As a U.S. Army medic or a volunteer at voting polls, they have strived to help and empower others. The recipient has a lifelong commitment to family and community. It has been said that these are their primary motivations and their nourishment. They are committed to their values and decisions are driven by them. A prime example is that early in their life, they returned to Keene to pro provide support to their family after their brother died defending our country. Now let's look at quantitative attributes. We all like numbers and this person has plenty of them. One, volunteer at Manadnock Family Services. Two YMC capital campaigns, the move from West Street to Roxbury Street and the current campaign currently underway. Three, grand, three children, four grandchildren, one great-grandchild and another on the way. Four terms in the New Hampshire legislature, including one term with his daughter. Five organizations worked with that start with C. Cedar Crest Community Chest, now known as the Munatnock United Way, Children's Theater, Cancer, Cancer Society, including being chair, and Cheshire Historical Society, 
including being president. 26 years with Mason Insurance Agency, where personal service was their hallmark. 30 years of volunteer service at Cheshire Medical Center. 38 hours a week of volunteering at Cheshire Medical Center and MFS. 50 years as Red Cross volunteer, including being county chair. Many other organizations that they have contributed to, including American Legion, Home Health Care and Community Services, School Board Selectmen, PTA at Tilton School. 88 years old and still volunteering. If you haven't figured it out yet, he is a dapper dresser and wears a bow tie. I am honored to announce that the recipient of the 2009 Greater Keene Chamber of Commerce Citizen of the Year is H. Thayer Kingsbury. We will be calling Thayer, who is on a special trip with one of his granddaughters, directly after this event to let him know. We plan on presenting a plaque to him at a future occasion. His wife and two of his children are with us tonight, and we will have the opportunity to recognize them after a snapshot of Thayer Kingsbury made last week, with a lot of uh, last-minute help from people that I, I should recognize. But uh, let's just say that this was uh, put together to give that special element his personality. Now, I know you're not going to be able to all see over here, so maybe you want to stand up or just bear with us, but we'll have some video or some audio to go with this. This was put together by, with the help of um, Cheshire Medical Center and Eastern Video. Well, you've been a volunteer in the community for many years. What is your motivation for s such service? Well, I've always been much interested in the community. So when I first came back to Keene, I got involved early on. And that was something that you did because you, uh, you had models for that, or is it something that you came up with yourself? Yes, my family had always been very active in various organizations. And I started first with the Red Cross and just developed from that point on. I think it's important that I, I give my time to organizations that give so much back to the community. What role do you think that volunteering plays in the health of our community? Well, I think Keene is great because there is so much interest in volunteering. I know as I went through the years, <clears throat> I never had any trouble. Anybody I asked was always ready and willing to, to lend a helping hand. What has volunteering meant to you personally? I enjoy working with people and, and seeing people, meeting people. It's been a right from the beginning, of way back in my school days. I've, I've always enjoyed doing things of, in the social service work. And I feel that it, it's important to be working with and for, for the community. What other significant things have you done in the community or are you doing now, volunteer-wise? Well, now I'm volunteering here as well as Madadnock Family Services. Uh, I've volunteered for some 50 years at the Red Cross, and I have worked with the Wooded Home and Cancer and many other of, of the organizations, Home Health and uh, Cedar Crest, uh, many organizations that I think are important to the community that I've been very happy to spend time working with and for them. Well, for the last 30 years here at Cheshire Medical, I've been volunteering 
probably 38 to 40 hours a week. That would be the equivalent of a full-time job. Well, I take it as such. I enjoy it so much. With that kind of commitment, sometimes it might be hard, though, to get up on a cold morning and get into here. What, what really keeps you going or, or makes you make that commitment? Yeah, I think it's because I enjoy so much what I'm doing. And the staff here work so hard and work so well together that I feel it's important to be part of it. But if you had to tell a young person, for instance, your granddaughter, about volunteering, and maybe it would be something that she would consider, what would you tell her? Well, that's an interesting question because my grandson was coming up for the few days at Christmas time and he called ahead to find out if I knew of any place he could volunteer on his school vacation uh, here in Keene and I was quite impressed with that. Um, I don't think I would have to say a whole lot to my granddaughter about volunteering because now she's in graduate school, but she's still volunteering in the, in the community of Rock Hill, South Carolina. And she works with a day camp during the summer. She works with uh, Little League Baseball. And she does a lot uh, with the uh, Chamber of Commerce helping people in, in even while she's in school. Well, I'd just like to say that I think what you do is both commendable and inspirational. And I've personally benefited uh, from your volunteering and, and I know many, many others have as well. So I want to thank you very much. Well, I thank you. Uh, uh. Still going strong. You bet. <laughs>
I wrote down a bunch of things, and finally what I realized is that he would pro he'd be speechless. So that kind of got me off the hook. So I thought, well, I just won't say anything. Um, and he'd be, he'd be speechless because what he does, he does because he wants to. He, it's, it's his lifeblood, and what he gets back is, is enough. Um, but this is enormous to recognize him for that. And, um, and he'd be a wreck if he were here, so. Um, and it's been a special, for me, privilege to be able to work with Cameron on this because I've known Cameron for a long time and we've been on boards together and what he put into this, the dedication, the diligence, the time, the patience. He knows more about my father and my family than probably anybody wants to. And um, <clears throat> um, of all the people who do so much in this community and all the saints on my roster, my two top are my dad and Cameron Tees. Um, and I, I guess finally, I think I'm speaking for my whole family. Um, if it's true that giving, volunteering, being part of the community, doing for others, as has been said, researched, whether it's bowling alone or the Bible, um, makes you live longer, makes your life richer and longer, then my dad's gonna be around for a long time. As are many people in this community. And um, so with that, I thank you all so much. One more round of applause. In the year 2000, uh, when I first came to Keene and, and uh, started off my career as the chamber president, at the Pumpkin Festival, that night, I walked downtown, and I looked at all these pumpkins and all these people, and I went, oh my god, I am really in a very special place. And I was overwhelmed. And tonight, I feel the same. Um, Thayer Kingsbury is just phenomenal. That CNS is here and does all the thing they do as a company just makes us really better for who we are. And I want to thank all of you because again, as Brian said, it's the who in the water, maybe not the what is in the water. And we are a special community because of you, because of a Thayer Kingsbury, because of a CNS, because of a Bill O'Mara. Um, and I could name 20 other names in this room, easily, uh, that have had major impacts that makes us who we are. And um, being an outsider, I came here in the 70s, left for a while, came back, um, and I came back because of the people in this room and the kind of community we are. So again, I thank you so very much for who you are and what you bring to this community. And um, that's why we're so good. And thank you very much. That really wasn't on my script, so that was kind of an ad lib. Um, Again, I want to congratulate the uh, Windsor Brooks Business of the Year winners, CNS Wholesale Groceries, they are Kingsbury. Uh, again, you know, two well, well-deserving groups. Uh, I want to thank our board and our chair for all their hard work. Uh, it really is a working board, and, and without them, we would not be successful. Uh, I want to thank the gala committee, Sue Blothenberg, Marianne Christensen, Harry Ahern, Bob Cox, Amy Lair, Lisa Nugent and Karen House for all their work. Thank you so very much. 
Um, none of this happens, none of what we do at the chamber uh, happens without our staff. Um, really, truly nothing. And I, and I know that more than you know that. Um, I want to thank our Commerce Coordinator, Cindy Boynton, Susan Newcomer, give them a little round of applause. Um, our office staff, Natalie Reed, Susan Whitley, and my right-hand man, Brenda Woods, our office manager, thank you so very much for all you do. And now I want to introduce uh, Cindy Boynton, to can, uh, who will uh, thank again tonight's sponsors for all their contributions. Good evening. This has been a wonderful night, and that's thanks in large part to this evening's sponsors. And I, it's my pleasure to go over once again. I know Brian's already mentioned them, and if you'll allow me, I'd like to uh, mention them again. I think it's worth saying uh, a second time. Um, this evening's platinum sponsors are CNS Wholesale Grocers and Monadnock Economic Development Corporation. We also have gold sponsors, Citizens Bank, Peerless Insurance Company, Ocean Bank, Public Service Company of New Hampshire, Connecticut River Bank, Marriott Courtyard, and Cheshire Medical Center, Dartmouth Hitchcock Keene, excuse me. Our silver sponsors for this evening are Smith's Medical, Savings Bank of Walpole, and Massiello Employment. Our music sponsor, the National Grange, our host sponsor, Keene State College, and the creator of our beautiful flowers, the Millhouse Florist. And we had a wonderful spread of hors d'oeuvres, I hope you all agree, and that those were brought to us in part by First Course, Luca's Mediterranean Cafe, Kristen's Bakery, the Olive Garden, Bentley Commons, and the Sodexo staff. Thank you to all of them. And there's one more constituency that I'd like to thank this evening, and that's all of you who chose to bring a non-perishable food item or cash for our community kitchen food drive. The food drive was a new aspect that we decided to bring to our annual event. And um, after seeing the large stash of food out front earlier tonight, um, I can say that it's been a resounding success. So thank you for that. On behalf of the gala committee, the chamber staff, and the community kitchen staff, thank you very, very much. Uh, in closing, uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, I'd like the immediate past and current winners of the business and citizen of the year to join me uh, at the podium after everything's over for a photo op so that we can have you up here and all the guests can come up and congratulate you. I want to thank all of you and other members of our supporting, of our membership for supporting our business community and in getting involved. Remember, the world is run by the people who get involved. Please get involved. Safe travel, good luck, and Happy New Year. Thank you for being here.
Thank you.